Hey guys, it's Ajay here, aka Walting Wizard, and today I'm going to be talking about how to play fast. Um, this is actually like the third time I'm going to be talking about how to play fast because I keep messing up my recording settings, so I've made this video like three times. But anyway, so I think this is a very mystifying part of uh, when beginners watch more uh, more competitive players and they're watching the, like the advanced players play on YouTube they sort of see how fast the pieces are and they get all these misconceptions like oh their reaction time must be insane and uh, like oh their fingers must be lightning fast and it's actually not as complicated as you would think right so I sort of want to demystify that in this video so without further ado how to play fast so first of all what does it mean to be fast well let's look at Microblaze because he is by far the fastest player in the world um, he cleared 40 lines in 17.5 seconds, which, I mean, you can already do the math, and you can tell that that is an insane, uh, insanely fast time, but even more insane is that no one else has really come close to this time. This is, like, almost, like, 20% faster than any other player is. So, he's crazy. Let's watch it. Right, so so that was that, and uh, that was insane, right? So <laughs> I think when people watch that, uh, the things that I want you to note is that I'm gonna put this video in the description, by the way. But uh, the things that I want you guys to note uh, when you watch this video is not only how fast he moves, but how smoothly he moves, right? When he does that, the pieces never backtrack. They never start in one place and sort of go back to another place. They don't sort of go back and forth a couple times. You don't see the indecision. Even if he has some indecision mentally, you never see it physically, right? The sm pieces just sort of smoothly glide where they're supposed to go, right? So that's what I want you to note. And then throughout this video, you'll sort of learn how to do that with your own play. So how to play fast. Let's just make sure I'm in the right view here because I'm paranoid now because of how many times I've done this video. So Okay, I'm in the right view. So. I'm going to break it down to the three major sides. They're going to sort of affect each other, so I'll do a little bit of bouncing back and forth, but uh, these are sort of going to be the main categories, right? There's the mental side, how to think in order to uh, maximize the efficiency of your playing. Um, the mechanical side, which is going to be the biggest portion of this, uh, this is called finesse, by the way. Um, I honestly was playing with the idea, instead of calling this how to play fast, just tutorial on finesse, right? That, that was something I was considering doing. Uh, because that's just such a huge part that people miss uh, when they're trying to play faster. They just sort of like move their fingers faster and they don't have a clear plan of what they're doing. Right? So we'll talk a lot about that and how to practice it. And then finally the physical side, um, that's just going to be the weird stuff like that people consider boring, like, I don't know, making sure you have good posture, your hands are relaxed. You don't want to develop carpal tunnel because of Tetris, right? So we'll talk about a little bit how to like do stretches, make sure your fingers are nimble for some good Tetris playing. So without, um, so yeah, moving on the mental side. Uh, the first thing you want to do. This is going to sound a little bit basic, but uh, it's okay to be a little bit basic. I think I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page, All right? So let me get my mouse here. And uh, so on the field, there'll be this next piece cue on the side, right? And you want to make sure you're really paying attention to that at all points. Uh, even if it takes you a little bit longer to place your current piece where it's supposed to go, you want to use that time efficiently to think about when the next pieces are going so that you're never wasting any time while you're playing. Right? The second thing you want to do, which is a little bit basic, is uh, paying attention to the whole field when you play. Uh, when I watch a lot of beginners play, something that I see a lot is that if they place a piece on the far right of their screen, if they're able to play the, n the next couple pieces on the right side of the screen, even if it's better to be on the left side of the screen, they've sort of tunnel vision there, and they'll continue to place pieces there. And that's no good. Uh, so you want to make sure you are always have awareness of your entire stack shape as you're playing. Um, the last thing, these two things sort of go together, is uh, limiting the moment of hesitation. This is mostly going to be a mechanical issue, but the idea is you never want to react to where the pieces are. You want to know where you're going to place the piece ahead of time and then just let your fingers do the work and place it there without reacting to whether or not that's correct. 
Uh, why do we want to do that? Um, you'd think you probably react pretty quickly, right? But it takes five pieces to clear two lines in Tetris, which means over the course of 40 lines, you're going to be placing at least 100 blocks. Uh, as you can saw in the, see in the micro blaze, you can never really end a 40 line game with a perfect clear, so it's going to end up being uh, a little bit more than 100 blocks. Human reaction time is like a little less than 0.2 seconds, so we'll say a little bit more than 100 blocks, round that down, a little bit less than 0.2 seconds, we'll round that up to like roughly balance out, because this is just to make a point, not doing it exacts. But basically, um, over the course of the thing, if you're reacting to each piece individually, you're going to add an extra 20 seconds of just looking at the ghost piece before you place it. So you don't you definitely want to get rid of that, right? Because that's you're never going to break 40 seconds if you're reacting to uh how you placed each piece, right? So because that's just an extra 20 seconds that you're literally not doing anything. So practicing the mental side, um this first part measuring proficiency is going to be a little uh high level, I guess. Uh it's not going to apply to anything specifically, but I think when you're practicing, you want to break things down into levels uh so you can hit checkpoints, right? So the first level is you don't understand this technique at all. Not only can you not do it, but you don't even understand how it's done, right? Um, so that's say like it's like baseline, right? So that's the level zero of a technique. Um, level one is going to be you understand how to do the technique, but maybe you can't do it yet. You have to practice more. You have to sort of get it in your muscle memory, right? So that's level one. Level two, you can execute the technique as separate parts. Um, so for example, in DAS right tap back. Uh, finesse, which we're going to be talking about finesse in the next slide, so don't worry if that doesn't make sense to you yet. But if you think of it as DAS to the right, and then tap left, and then drop as three separate parts, you can execute DAS tap back uh, finesse, but you're thinking of it separately. Ideally, you want to get to level three, which is when you think of all those three things as one motion as you do it. Um, I think most people stop at level two, and then it sort of limits them speed wise. Right, because you want to think about each of these things as one motion, if possible. Uh, the next thing I recommend doing, I used to do this a lot um, in high school because I had a lot of friends who like also played Tetris and maybe weren't as good. Uh, when you watch slower players, you want to sort of look at their next piece cue and try to place all the pieces in your head uh, before they have placed their current one. Uh, so you sort of try to like outperform them mentally. I think this uh, helps. Uh, to train the mental side without getting bogged down with thinking about how to place the pieces a lot because you want to make sure that you're mentally thinking as quickly as possible because that's going to be in the long run the limiting factor at first obviously finesse is going to be the limiting factor but in the long run the mental part is going to be really hard and then reminding yourself to focus on the center of the screen to avoid tunnel vision I think most people do this mostly when they play but then uh, maybe in high pressure situations it's a tournament or like you challenge your friends to some like bet you know, money match or something um, in that sort of situation you're gonna have to remind yourself to uh, focus on the center of the screen um, because I think that that's one of the first things that go away when people get nervous alright so let's get into the meat of it uh, so what's finesse right so finesse is the way in which you get your tetramino to the final resting place right so for example in 6a it's showing how to get this T tetramino into this uh, place where the ghost piece is showing. And so it's saying that the best way to do that is to tap right twice and then drop the T. So obviously that sounds a little bit uh, obvious, but then some of the other ones are a little bit less obvious, right? So for example here, you could get this uh, T block to the final resting place by tapping it uh, right three times. But of course it would take one less, um, it would take one less uh, keystroke if you DAS, it. DAS stands for uh, delayed auto shift by the way so that just means that you've held down the key so that the piece goes all the way to the side um, so if you DAS it to the right wall and then tap left once that only took two keystrokes um, which is better than the three of tapping right three times uh, in some of the slower games of Tetris de DASing is really slow in which case this might not hold but uh, I think it's important to just use it anyway because it's gonna <laughs> it, it's gonna be good to be in that habit and once again you want it to like feel like one motion right um, so I think the important things to note when you're looking the important patterns that you're gonna see when you're looking at uh, optimal finesse is that um, in general you want to rotate before moving uh, and then DASing and tapping back, as we just saw, is uh, 
always going to be faster than tapping three times. And then uh, the last pattern you're going to see is that uh, rotating counterclockwise versus clockwise actually changes um, the position of where S, Z, and I blocks end up. And so it's important to take note of which one of those you do, even though they uh, are symmetric pieces, and so it seems like they end up in the same place. They're in the same orientation, but they're actually in a different place. So just taking note of that is going to be better. So rotating clockwise is always going to move the piece a little bit to the right. Like, it's going to round to the right, I guess, uh, versus uh, rotating clockwise is always going to round to the left. Let's talk about practicing finesse. Luckily, you don't need to figure out the optimal way to do any of this because it's been done for you. So let's just look at it. So here we are. This is SRS movement finesse. Um, we're going to take it one piece at a time, right? So let's look at O piece finesse first. Uh, so for O piece finesse, obviously there's only one orientation, so you're not going to see any of the other ones. And it's pretty straightforward. I think if you read this, you'll get the pattern pretty quickly, right? So uh, next, I don't want to talk about T. Uh, L or J yet, but let's talk about, say, an S. So uh, the original orientation is obviously going to be the same as an O piece, but more interestingly, we see that it starts telling you whether to rotate counterclockwise or clockwise in the descriptions here. And that goes along with what I was saying earlier, where um, if you rotate clockwise here, you see how there are three gaps on the left. If I, you were to rotate clockwise here, it would be one square over to the right. And so there would be four here, and so the DAS would take slightly longer. So that's why it specifies here. Um, it's especially important when it gets to the orientation that's right next to the wall. So for example, in 2B, you see a DAS is to the left wall and then rotates clockwise. If you were to rotate counterclockwise there, since that rounds to the left, um, you, you'll actually end up uh, with the piece still along the wall. So it's important to take note of which way you rotate for uh, that case. And lastly, um, if for T, L, and J, obviously there are four unique orientations, right? So what I want to talk about is uh, for the rotating twice orientations. So for 2D, let's say. So is that a good one? Yeah, let's talk about that one. So um, it's telling you to tap left twice and rotate twice. Notice how when it says rotate, it doesn't specify which way because uh, both directions will reach the same uh, conclusion if you do it twice instead of once, right? And then when it says rotate twice, it's just using this as an extra step after a double tap because it's trying to be consistent in this terminology. It's perfectly fine and in fact faster if instead of doing tap left twice, rotate twice and drop, you tap left, rotate, tap left, rotate, and then drop. In most cases, that'll be faster. There are some in which you have to keep the orientation as you're DASing because otherwise it messes up your orientation. For example, let's see if I can find one. Right, this one. So you wouldn't want to be in the middle of rotating while you're DASing here because then the piece is going to be flat against the wall and then this tap back isn't quite going to work, right? So uh, in some cases, so like in this one, tap right, tap right, rotate twice, you can uh, alternate. In other ones, you can't. Uh, so that's something to take note of. Uh, let's head back to my PowerPoint. Hit the right button. All right, cool. So. As you're practicing this, uh, I want you to take it one piece at a time. So maybe only focus on O blocks at first. And every time you see an O block, make sure you place it correctly. And then sort of add in the other pieces as you go. If you're making a finesse, a finesse mistake a lot, you want to start repeating that key sequence a lot, uh, even if you don't have a field in front of you, just to get it in your hands. And then lastly, in order to eliminate the hesitation and the reaction element, you want to try to know where a piece is going to go without letting it spawn into the matrix so that you never need to react to where the ghost piece is. You can sort of just play without that reaction time. So I'm going to try to demonstrate that a little bit. Um, so let's uh, get away from full screen again. What am I doing? That one. And let's hop over the Jstris. So this is just regular sprint. I'm not going to be caring about the time at all. All I'm going to be caring about is making sure that I'm placing my pieces optimally. right? So let's say for this one, I want it to be on this side. okay? But let's say I don't quite know what I'm doing yet. And so I go here, and then I rotate this way. right? Oh no, that placed it one over to the side. So that was wrong. So let's say I'm working on eyepieces right now. So I want to make sure I get that one right. right? 
So uh, next time I place an eyepiece, I'm going to make sure that I rotate clockwise when I DAS to the wall, right? So let's get the next eyepiece just so we can practice this. So it's it starts in the middle, and then we DAS, rotate clockwise. So now I'm going to rotate counterclockwise, move it back, and then DAS, rotate clockwise. Rotate counterclockwise, move it back. I really want to get that in my hands. And then obviously the gravity is going to stop me. But now I've sort of like understood that uh, finesse mistake that I was making before. Obviously, you don't need to do this every time you make a finesse mistake, but if you notice that you're making one commonly, I recommend repeating it like that. Um, so as you sort of get uh, more comfortable, you want to try to make it through an entire sprint time uh, without this finesse counter uh, going above a certain amount. Eventually, you want this to stay zero, right? So the next step would be I see a piece, and now I know ahead of time that I want to tap left twice and drop it, so then I'm just going to do that in one motion. I know that I want to just place this, so I'm just going to do it. I know that I want to tap right twice, so I'm just going to do it. And then this one, oh, I've practiced this one, right? It's DAS and rotate clockwise, and here it is. And then this one, I'm going to alternate between rotating and tapping because that's more efficient before I place it. And so you sort of go through and you see this finesse counter is still zero because I'm doing everything optimally, right? Um, let's say it doesn't make sense in this case, but just to demonstrate the DAS and then rotate, we'll just do one of those real quick. So that was optimal finesse instead of uh, rotating it and then trying to move it to the left. And you sort of go through and try to play a whole game of sprint, uh, never messing this up. So for example here, uh, let's say I want to move it to all the way to the right hand side, uh, but I rotate it the wrong way, right? Let's say I rotate uh, like counterclockwise and then move it there, right? Uh, so that wasn't quite optimal because I wanted to rotate clockwise first. Um, so you want to make sure you just get rid of any of those finesse mistakes as possible. So that was tap back. And then, um, so right, so that's the next step. But of course, this is still reacting to where the piece is and then sort of figuring out the finesse from there. So from here, you want to start doing it in chunks instead. Right? So for example, I want to place this I block all the way to the right, and then I want to place this L block in these three right here. And so instead of waiting for the L block to spawn, I'm going to figure out what both of those finesses are at the same time. So I'm going to DAS this one all the way to the right, and then I'm going to tap left twice. And so I want to do that without reacting. I just want to do the pieces that I'm going to do. So I want to hold this T block, or I don't know, whatever. Let's put it all the way on the right. And then I know that this, uh, JP, or this Z piece is already in the right direction, so I'm just going to hit spacebar twice. right? So I don't need to react to the Z piece spawning in the correct position. I've played enough that I know where it's going to spawn ahead of time. right? So you can sort of see how you can um, start doing like two pieces and then three pieces and sort of work your way up and try to play with like optimal finesse while not reacting. So that would be the next step that I would do. And then after that, you want to just start moving your fingers faster and by this point if you've done this a lot for multiple games it, the finesse should be in your muscle memory already is the idea so that was my demonstration for finesse let's go back to my powerpoint Do -do -do. practicing finesse yes let's uh, full screen it all right <coughs> So you want to take it one piece at a time you want to repeat the common finesse mistakes i showed you all this and then um try to know where a piece is going to go before letting it spawn. So that's uh, doing it in chunks, right? Two pieces at a time, three pieces at a time. So that's how you practice finesse. Um, I think when you're starting out, that's going to be the bulk of how you get faster at the game. Um, so I would repeat those exercises a lot um, and really try to get it in your muscle memory. The faster that you can get finesse down, the easier you're going to start progressing through the time. Um, all right, so next, physical side. Uh, so first of all, for a good keyboard setup, you don't want to be moving your fingers a lot. I think a common beginner mistake that people make is that they have their arrow keys with these three fingers, but then they'll only use these two fingers on their left hand. And so what they'll do is they'll have their uh, index finger on space, they'll have their middle finger on shift, and if they want to rotate counterclockwise with Z, they'll take their middle finger, they'll move it over to Z, and then move it back to shift. You have extra fingers. You don't need to do this, right? It's actually better to have your ring finger on shift. You don't have to do exactly this way. This is just the way that I do. But you, it, it would be better to have your ring finger on shift, middle finger on Z, point, uh, index finger on uh, space. So that way you don't need to move your fingers uh, to different keys when you play. And obviously the more fingers you use, the more resources you have at your disposal to play quickly. right? So that's the first thing. 
Second part is having relaxed hands. I think this mostly happens in like high pressure situations. Let's say there's hurry up garbage or it's a tournament match. Um, it is impossible to play consistently if you have like extraneous movements and extraneous tension in your hands because tension is inherently inconsistent, right? So I think the most important part when you have relaxed hands, first of all, you wanna make sure you know you stretch things out, stretch things out, and then you actually wanna make sure your posture is pretty aligned. So you wanna make sure your spine is pretty uh, straight when you're playing, right? Because the more straight your spine is, the more your shoulders will be able to just release down and that'll let you have your hands pretty relaxed. When, there, when there's no tension in the upper part of your arms, it's a lot easier to have no tension in the lower parts of your arms so that your fingers can start to move quickly. Um, for those of you who have played piano, you know that in order to have good finger health, you want to be hinging at the knuckle, the base of the knuckle, as much as possible when you're moving your fingers, right? Because that's just a lot stronger muscle and it's gonna wear down your fingers less, right? And don't uh, lift your hands up super high while you're playing. You want to keep them pretty close to the keys, right? This picture is just a blur because this is actually Micro Blizz playing. Uh, that's the video that we saw earlier. And yeah, so that's all I want to say about the physical side. It's not super important, but it's just something to keep in mind, maintaining good hand health and uh, having a good keyboard set up to set yourself up to be able to play just as fast as anyone else. Uh, so that's the end. Um, I'm going to have the couple links in the description. I'm going to have, uh, obviously, the link of MicroBlizz's 17.5 uh, world record. I'm going to have the finesse link so you can study the charts for yourself. And the last link I'm going to put is this link right here. This is the leaderboard on harddrop.com. Harddrop is a, um, it's a pretty popular uh, uh, forum site for Tetris. Uh, all the top players are there. And there's this nice uh, chart over here you can see where people have posted their best sprint times. You can see these are the few people who haven't broken a minute yet. Um, so it's sub one minute and 10 seconds. Uh, here's sub one minute. You can see there's like a whole host of people, sub 30, a little bit less, sub 25. And then they're the lone two in the sub 20 category. There are actually two other players who have broke 20 seconds, but they just haven't bothered posting it yet. So feel free to make an account on hard drop and uh, reply your best sprint score um, to this uh, thread. Uh, it just provides a good way to like measure your improvement, right? Uh, this is Jaquan who maintains this. He's actually uh, the person who I did the analysis on, if any of you guys watched that video as well. <coughs> so yeah, I'll put that in the description. And uh, so that's the end of this video. Next, um, I've had requests on how to downstack. I might do that one next. Uh, I don't know if I want to continue only doing basic tutorials, uh, so I might intersperse it a little bit. So perhaps the next one will be a TKI setup, which is sort of how to consistently get three T-spins going in uh, Tetris, and then maybe I'll go back to some of the more uh, basic parts. Uh, I kind of want to do like a fun tutorial at some point, maybe like a DT Cannon or some like fancy setup, just to like mix things up a little bit. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, all for me. Hopefully you guys learned something, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.